Good day, John. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. It's a pleasure and a significant honor as well to be <laughs> asked. Well, thank you. Um, for our audience, we're going to introduce you through a series of questions that I have here, kind of a four-part <laughs> introduction, if you will. But okay. to start off with, where did you grow up? I was born in London, but I grew up mostly in Southend on Sea, um, which is on the estuary, the Thames estuary, about 40 miles from London, a uh, seaside resort. Um, uh, but a, really a dormer town for the, for the city as well, which is how I came to be there really, because how I came to be in England, because uh, my Norwegian forebears had been in shipping and shipping insurance and came over to the city of London um, uh, at the end of the 19th century. So I grew up in South End of the Sea in Essex, which for um, people in the US might not necessarily appreciate this, it's a bit of a joke place to come from. I didn't realize it until I left there, went elsewhere. And we have uh, The Only Way is Essex and uh, lots of very cruel and sexist jokes about Essex girls and so on. All right. Well, we don't need to go into all of that. No. <laughs> so, so where did you go to college and what did you study? Um, I went to Sussex University, which at that time on the South Coast, which at that time was a place a lot of people went where they failed Oxbridge entrance, which I'd done. I, I applied Cambridge, but my French wasn't good enough, although I'd applied for English literature. So I went to read English literature at Sussex University, which is in Brighton, another seaside town. So it just seems I'm incapable of living anywhere that isn't a seaside town, because that's where I now, to hit your next question, that's where I now live and work. Um, pretty well settled here in Brighton. I did try to move up to London for a while, um, but I, I met a woman who was from Brighton um, we reproduced and decided we'd move back down to Brighton to bring the kids up. We have four and now a lovely grandchild. Oh, well, congratulations on all that. I know that, uh, you know, I think the old saying, at least here in the United States, is that there's only one reason to have children, and that's yeah. so we'll have grandchildren. <laughs> anyway. Yes, yeah, so, so you can get your own back on there. So you can get the own back, your own back on your own kids, and when their <laughs> kids play them up, you say, yeah, now, mm, now you see exactly. Exactly. That's exactly the point here is that you revisit the sins of their past on them and you get to enjoy it. That's yeah. Right. So, uh, so where do you, uh, where, what are you doing now? Where, and where are you? I, I know that you're in Brighton, so I'll just preface with that. But so, yeah. uh, what do you do now? Uh, now I'm, um, uh, a marketing consultant for hire and I run two podcasts, the learning hack, which is interviews with um, influencers and whoever appears to be important in shaping the future of learning and just people I'm interested in. Uh, then the other one is called Great Minds on Learning, um, which is a series of conversations with Donald Clark, um, who knows everything that there is to know about learning theory and has uh, written a succession of blogs, which cover two and a half thousand years of writing about learning from the Greeks to the geeks right to the present day. Um, and we split that down into episodes and we do into seasons. We do kind of six on uh, six, six episodes per season. And each episode covers probably somewhere about half a dozen theorists on a particular theme, the most recent about informal learning. Um, and the next one is the Greeks. We're going to do Plato and Aristotle. I'm looking forward to that one. Mm -hmm. Yes, I've been following those. And uh, I, I first saw the blog post that Donald was doing. I, I've got in my file someplace 50 of his blog posts that I mm. into PDFs to take on the road with me back in 2012. So he's been at this for a while and he seems to uh, be almost a walking encyclopedia when it comes to uh, learning and development and, and learning going way back, as you say. But I really enjoy your podcast and I'm going to Thank put... You. In the YouTube video, in the show notes, I'm going to put links to the various links to you, but and to your two podcast series, so that people can maybe uh, who aren't aware of these uh, might join in and start uh, participating as a listener in that and learning through that means. Uh, but let's uh, let's continue with the introduction of you. And so now you're doing marketing and you've got these podcasts and you, I get the feel that you kind of specialize in marketing in L and D, but that may not be true. That is true. After you finished 
school, college, university, we're, let's go through the progression of jobs that you had because it's quite diverse. And one of the things I'd like to do with the <laughs> audience here is help them understand, you know, what's the route to where you got to today? Was it a straight path or was it circuitous? It was arrow straight. I was completely um, aimed at doing what I would know. That's all rubbish. It was career in the sense of something moving downhill very quickly and in no particular uh, direction. Um, immediately after I'd done my English literature degree, uh, I, I chucked that over my shoulder and formed a punk ska band called The Piranhas uh, with a guy I met in a pub. And I spent the next few years of my life um, going up and down uh, the UK in the back of a transit van uh, playing gigs with this punk ska band. And we became quite credible. Uh, we were big favourites of a DJ called John Peel, um, well known to people in the UK. Uh, and if he kind of put his uh, seal on you, then you were, you know, you could play um, every scuzzy pub venue uh, in, in the country pretty much. So so we did that for quite a while. I'm quite happy. And then sort of by accident, we had a hit single. Uh, and we went on top of the pops with this thing as well. Um, it, it was kind of a, based on a instrumental of a, a South African type of music called Quayla from the 50s that... Um, someone's parents happened to have in the record collection and we, we wrote some lyrics to it and so on, put it on. So it was a big hit and um, we, we were very resilient in coping with the, um, the many vicissitudes that beset a struggling band on the road. We, we were well equipped to deal with failure. We weren't equipped to deal with success. So the success of the singles kind of split us up. Uh, at that point, I formed a, with um, some other people, formed a, uh, what could we call it, a a, a street busking cabaret group called Pookie Snackenberger. Um, I was tired of all the black boxes and the, the scuzzy clubs um, with rock and roll. Uh, so we played in the street and then ended up doing kind of theatre shows. We had five Edinburgh festivals. We toured all over Europe. Uh, we did a TV series of mini musicals, which we wrote, acted in, did all the music for. Um, and I did quite a bit of writing for that. Um, and when that band broke up, uh, Half of them went on to form Stomp, the international theatrical sensation. Uh, I didn't. I did some um, some very obscure house records. Then I got a job in a West End advertising agency um, because I'd got married and I needed to pay the rent. And that's sort of where my marketing career began, again, almost by accident. Um, I, and I became a marketing consultant, moved back down to Brighton, wrote a novel, uh, which I got published, and four albums worth of lyrics for the progressive rock band Marillion. I, I can't tell you how that happened. It would just take too long to explain. Um, so that was kind of how I came to be in marketing. And then I could, should I carry on to the next bit, which is the kind of dot-com boom? Um, yes, please. In the dot-com boom, I uh, found a job in a stand-up training company, um, creating and marketing stand-up sit down courses uh, uh, about the internet, you, you know, this new thing at the time and about internet marketing. Uh, and I not only marketed them, but I, I actually created the courses along with um, SMEs, um, which I had no qualification to do. Um, at, at some point, I think I heard the term instructional design when I'd kind of done about um, 20 of these things. And I thought, oh yeah, well, that sounds interesting. Maybe we'll do a course on instructional design for learning. Uh, but at that point, I got headhunted to go to a, 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 a proper um, online uh, learning company, Epic, uh, based in Brighton, um, which is where I met Donald. And Epic at that time was probably producing something like 50% of all the e-learning content that was made in the UK. It was sort of head and shoulders above most of the, the rest of the competition. So it's a significant uh, boosted my career in learning technologies to be head of marketing for Epic. Um, had a very good time there. Uh, then I was headhunted to go to another e-learning company, Future Media, another head of marketing role. Um, and since then, I've done mostly freelance marketing roles and also occasionally head of marketing full-time jobs, but pretty much freelancing now because I don't want to give up doing the podcasts, which I started in 2019, the first one, um, and is now... Kind of the main thing that I do. I also work with companies on there, getting their stuff across. When I say marketing, really, as time's gone on, I moved towards thought leadership, which is kind of a term I hate. So I've done some work with PR, and it's really a part of 
of, of that. But it, it emerged that kind of in the particular market we're in, in learning, there is a lot of explaining to be done between the vendors, what they're selling and what the practitioners need and how they use this stuff. Um, so that really became my role to kind of um, set up ways of doing that. So it, it moved logically for change towards the podcasts. Um, and there, there are various other ways that I do that working with companies now, you know, blogging, writing books, uh, video interviews, and so on. Well, thank you for sharing with us uh, all of that background. Um, uh, moving on to my next question, um, this, this podcast that I'm doing, this video podcast, uh, which I started back in 2008, is all about what, what is labeled by some as human performance technology, HPT, or sometimes it's called human performance improvement. Way back in the 80s, it was called performance technology, and somebody bolted the human on the front of that, saying that you know all performance is human oriented. Um, but but so while I'm not sure about your orientation to human performance technology per se, I got mm -hmm. a sense from everything that I'm following uh, from you uh, in your podcast in particular, that you have a performance orientation. So while you may not be a self-declared HPT -er, uh, mm -hmm. I that, that you have that as part of your DNA. So, so are you familiar with human performance technology or human performance improvement? And where did you first come across that? Um, well, I've always called it e-learning or learning technologies. When it comes to the sort of practice side of it, uh, I'd, I'd use more generic terms, I suppose, like like learning. And with, within that, the actual way that you do it, I am kind of very interested in the, um, the, 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 the performance orientated transfer side of it, because um, I, I, I've kind of seen and had to explain to people and written white papers and blogs about um, so much of that stuff. I mean, you know, it's kind of, I hope I'm not jumping ahead to a question you were going to ask me, but one of my earliest influences when I began to find out about e-learning, having got a job in e-learning, was uh, Jay Cross. Um, and I loved all the stuff he 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 wrote on his Internet Time uh, blog. And there are a cluster of people around him, uh, Charles Jennings and um, so on, who, Har Harold Yarkey, whose ideas I thought also were very interesting. I, but I noticed that there was a, a kind of disconnect between what all these people were saying and what the companies that I was working in were for the, for the most part delivering. Not necessarily so much the case with Epic, but with other kind of vendor companies. It, it was very much about kind of the LMS, this big admin system, or modules of online content and massive big compliance programs and so on and it, it, it seemed to be that to, to me that there was really interesting stuff being talked about um but less of the interesting stuff being done um so it, it kind of became my role to 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 bring those two sides of things together i think and i'd have to say it feels more as if we're getting there now with you know lxps and um a, a completely different and use of ai a completely different attitude to how, how, how you can use technology. It seems that the message got home. But that started for me with Jay Cross and, and a group of other people. Mm -hmm. Jay, uh, to our audience, most of them are going to know about Jay Cross, the late Jay Cross. But uh, mm. so he was very influential in, in bringing to the fore, you know, the term e-learning, as you mentioned in your podcast that I listened to just this morning that came out earlier today. Yes, but, I'm sorry, repeating stuff that I was in the <laughs> informal learning podcast. But, yeah. but that, but no, that's fine. And uh, in informal learning and the discussion about, you know, that most things are learned informally, quite happenstance most of the time, and not not deliberate. Um, but those of us who are in the L and D business are are involved in either the technology that helps people do their work or deploy their work. And, uh, but, but so we get, we sometimes get lost in the means and not focused on the ends, which is enabling people to perform uh, to whatever's required back in their, back at the workplace, back on the job. Mm. And, and so I know that you've been involved in that. I know that you uh, broach those topics uh, uh, in the things that you've written and the things that you uh, produce as a podcaster, but 
So early on, though, you, I mean, you worked for Donald Clark in Epic, uh, another firm. My my firm is Epic with two P's. This was uh, with one P. Yeah. And, uh, um, so you were uh, addressing the learning requirements of people through the things that you produced. So besides Jay Cross and and Donald Clark, who else were some of your influences as a, as a means here of of pointing to others that our audience may want to follow up with? Yeah, um, there is a long list, list of people and it will be, I mean, if, if you want to kind of look up my podcast and the people who've been on the Learning Hack, it's going to be very much those people because I, I tend to invite people on there who I think are influencers and who are interesting people, got to be interesting to say, people who have influenced me. So, I mean, it, it, it was great to talk to Bob Mosher, for instance, I'd, I'd seen him talk. Uh, Nick Shackleton Jones, um, brilliant to have Miriam Nealon on, who bangs the drum for for evidence based practice. Harold Yarke, um, I, I saw him at Learning Technologies uh, very early on in, in the noughties, I think, and to have him on the podcast is a big thrill. And he's still kind of doing the same stuff, and it's still massively relevant. Um, and then to talk to people on, on the more academic side, I suppose, like George Siemens was really good. Um, Julian Stodd, who's more of a kind of organizational development um, guru, consultant, got some really interesting ideas. Uh, Paul Matthews, who's, who's, who's about transfer. Um, I, I hate to do these lists because I'm then conscious I'm leaving people out, you know, and I think, oh, God, they're going to be so offended. All right, I mean, well, let it, me just cut you off here, and therefore it's my fault that you didn't list. Yes, it's his but, fault, yeah. But, but to your point, you covered a lot of these people in your podcast, and so, again, we'll point people to that podcast, and they may want to venture back to the very early ones um, mm -hmm. and, and start there and, you know, fill up any of their uh, what we would call windshield time or – or windshield time. I'm not sure if what the what the translation is for the car windshield. But uh, you know, if you have time and uh, you're not doing anything dangerous, and you can listen to a podcast, I think that you have a great series, and you bring out you've had a lot of great guests, and so uh, will suffice to say that your list of influencers are people that you've covered on your podcast. Yeah. Uh, so my next question this. This is this is the first time I've asked somebody who's really in marketing this question, so this will be very interesting. But uh, so I'm going to ask you to give us your 30 second elevator speech on what you do. And again, this is to provide an example uh, to the people in our audience of if you have you know 30 seconds or so, you know one floor, two floor, three floors going up in the lift. Um, what what is the what is your you know, answer to, you know, John, what do you do? <laughs> so my mother never understood what I did. Um, basically, I explain stuff to people who know as little or even less about it than I do by talking to people who know more than I'll ever know about the subject in public. I suppose that covers the podcasting. It also covers a lot of my, my marketing work with what I do with companies, actually. So I found what I end up doing is going into that company and talking to the people who actually make the stuff and you know i love talk, talking to learning designers about how they apply theory or you know what what whatever it is that that they use to 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 design learning um and then kind of opening that up to you know their clients but also potential clients and just people who are interested out there in the rest of the world so i i, I kind of feel that companies in an emerging market like ours are kind of a treasure, treasure chest of knowledge and wisdom that doesn't necessarily get out there um, because it's so often filtered through, you know, sales and marketing and the marketing people. And a lot of marketing people are really seem to be in the in in the business of hiding company secrets rather than actually kind of opening up what is in that company. The value creating processes of that company so that. Um, the community can benefit from it. And for me, that that is the right way to position yourself if you are doing marketing in an emerging market. And our, our market still is emerging. We're still only at the beginning of learning how to deploy the, the technologies that we have at our disposal to help people learn and to to make their lives better. Um, it, it, it often feels like, you know, the product categories get shut down 
and then we're just going to kind of turn the handle and sell this stuff. But that that is just not the way this market works. I mean, it's why it's such an interesting place to work, I think, is that um, continually people are putting products out and um, the practitioners are saying, no, that's not what we need at all. You know, these people need to to have resources, not courses and and, and, and so on. That was a, a long elevator ride. I'm sorry. <laughs> the original part of it, which I, I, I drafted, was quite concise, I think. When I, when I went to explain that, I ended up with paragraph after paragraph. Well, the way I pose this at times is that if you're at a, at a garden party or something in the neighborhood and somebody asks you what you do, you give them the short and, and, and uh, answer. And then if they want to know more, then you go longer. But you did give the short answer and then you then you did go long. So maybe mm -hmm. got off the uh, the lift or the elevator, as uh, we say over here. Um, and I think it, your your point is that, you know, this is we're in our infancy still. You know, I've been in the business here 43 years and it's still it's still ever evolving. And it's due to the technology. Um, and it's so it's quite a moving target in terms of you know, how we can get things done, how we can help people perform better on the job and have, you know, better, better lives. But um, let me switch gears here a little bit again. Uh, as a lifelong learner, can you share with us what you are focused on in learning? You know, what, what's your focus or foci? Um, and are you writing anything or doing anything besides producing your podcast on those things? But do you have a particular focus, I guess, is my real question. At, at the moment, my big focus is kind of sound and video production. Um, I taught myself to sound edit um, and then I taught myself to video edit. Um, and it's quite interesting because in the field that we're in, uh, you know, doing podcasts about learning, you, you, you kind of can't help but be kind of mindful of the way you're learning. It's very interesting to me that when I first started with uh, um, doing video production, video editing, I took a formal course on LinkedIn learning and similarly with the sound editing. Uh, and then after I, I started doing it, as I was learning that, I'd come up against problems and then I go out to the community, you know, I, I kind of Google stuff, you, you hang around on forums. With the sound editing, often it's uh, a matter of talking to people that you know who actually do it professionally, picking up trips. But mostly it's about kind of, I get a problem or, or I, I wanna make a quality improvement, so I have to, move on to into the area of stuff I like finding about frame rates and so on which is driving me up the wall at the moment um and then you're very kind of focused on finding the answer to that problem rather than kind of in the you know the, you, you'll do your formal bit of learning in the beginning then after that it's all in the flow of work and it's all about trying to give yourself a good flow so that's my focus at the moment um is sound and video production really i've, I've built a I, where I'm sitting at the moment, we call the Hack Shack. It's a garden studio in my back garden, which is soundproof. Um, so I can do sound and video in here and all the programs, the podcasts come from this. I'm also working on some other stuff. Um, I write creatively. I have a, a kind of personal side of things like that. And I've been doing for a while a kind of blogging um, project, live piece of life writing called Noted. Uh, that started off as short written pieces and that's begun to metamorphose and I'm, I'm creating music around it uh, and I've got a publisher in LA who wants to put a chat book out based on the, the, the work I'm doing this project so with any luck we'll, 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 we'll see an album, a chat book and maybe a bit more of the, uh, the, the blog from that project coming up. I'm not familiar with a, a, a chat book, do you say? Is that what Yeah, it? a chat book, it, it's a, a, a kind of thing that happens in poetry. I mean, people will be familiar with these kind of small books you get about, about 40 pages. Um, but chat books is, is a kind of 17th century form that has become quite trendy in literary circles. Um, often they're illustrated. They could be kind of like children's stories or like short illustrated stories for, for grown ups and you, or, or you can have poetry with them. So it's something I'm kind of trying to introduce into the learning technologies marketing work as well with Learning Pool. We're going to do a couple of chat books. It's just a different kind of format. Mm -hmm. well, thank something you. old, which is now something new. <laughs> exactly. 
things get recycled, don't they? Yeah. Uh, so my next question then, and, and I shared these questions with you before we started just uh, to let our audience know, but uh, our, the terminology, the language that we use uh, is problem. And I guess we, that was a segue from the, from the last bit in that, you know, what's old is new again. And we tend to take old things and put new names on them. Yeah. And so this has been an issue in the field since I joined. And I remember people back in the early eighties complaining about the sloppiness of our language and blah, blah, blah. But, but anyway, so I, this has been a standard part of these videos that I've been doing since 2008. And it's, the question is, is there a performance improvement term or phrase or a learning and development term or phrase that you would like to define for us? Because perhaps you feel it's being misused or misconstrued, or you just want to put your particular spin on it. But do you have a term or phrase for us today? This answer might be a bit of a cheat, but I think the, 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 the term that we most misuse is probably learning. Actually, when I first started to to, to work in this field, um, I kind of I, I really disliked it, although I don't think I ever said it out loud because I felt it was quite pretentious. I thought, you know, this is training, it's training with computers. If it, people asked me at a dinner party what I did. I said, well, you know, basically it's training with computers, but you put a lot of fancy language around it. I, I kind of changed my ideas on that. Um, and a lot of, of, of that has come through doing the uh, Great Minds on Learning podcast, actually, is I can see that there is something very beyond training that L&D people are doing. So it it, it 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 does merit another term. But I think the trouble is, if you call everything learning, the big problem is if you call everything learning, it, it tends to mean that you're going to have a course about it. Um, and really, there's a whole other area of stuff which you, know, you can give labels like sense making, performance support, you know, which of course you'd know about resources, not courses. Um, and there, there, there's very little, little learning in that. I mean, if we actually look at the kind of, you know, what cognitive psychologists would call learning, and we covered this on, on Great Minds on Learning, it, it's about getting stuff into long-term memory so that, you know, you will learn something at 20. Hopefully you, you'll still remember it when you're 65. Now, an awful lot of what we need to know to work in our day-to-day -day jobs and to function we're not going to need to know about that for more than just at this present moment or perhaps in the next week or perhaps it's something we do every month but uh, you know come a couple of years down the line a new process will come up you don't need to do that anymore you don't want to have to fill your long-term memory up with a load of stuff that really you only need for for shorter periods so i, I, I you know i wouldn't like to be hard and fast about this but i, I sort of feel it would be helpful if we could save the learning term for stuff that we really do want you know if it's about acquiring sort of stuff that that, that that you want to achieve a lifelong mastery in you know i'd put editing in that bracket really because you can learn to use an editing program but the actual kind of the aesthetic side of editing how you you make images work together and sound work together you, you're going to spend the rest of your life trying to achieve mastery in that it's, it's very difficult so we should make a distinction, I think, what's learning and what, what, what's not really learning. I, I, it doesn't quite answer the question, but was it worthwhile? Yeah, no, I think it was. It, uh, I, it's been an issue for me, too. I resisted changing from training to learning. And before that, it was instruction. So I've kind of gone back to, I think, instruction is a better term. It's because yeah. it's inclusive of uh, job aids and training or performance support and learning experiences and resources or courses. And when I talk about those kinds of things, I always put the job aid performance support resource up front because I wish people yeah. would default to that because we, we too often have uh, tried to force our learners to memorize things that the job does not require them to have memorized. They can look it up. Yeah. Um, and Absolutely. we reserve you know, a trying to achieve long-term memory of things or a honed skill for those things that are truly critical and required to be, you know, available on demand in the workflow. But, but, uh, but I blame Peter Sange for this and his fifth this yeah. book. Um, and I remember in the nineties, 
uh, just beginning in the 90s when that book first came out, every all the executives were reading that book. And so the people, my clients in the learning in the training and development organizations started changing their names. And some of them, after I questioned them, you know, so exactly why you were doing this, even though I thought I knew the answer. Some of them thought that they, the training organization, was the learning organization, which means they didn't read the book or read it for comprehension. But but so I blame him on the on the name shift, but you know, perhaps that was necessary because training was getting a bad name because it was so mm. poorly done, um, you know, using a kind of an education model versus an enterprise learning model is what I would call it today. But but so I thank you for that, because I think it's mm. important for people to know that the, our language has shifted over time. Sometimes we use a term or a phrase to mean multiple things. And that makes it confusing, especially for new people coming in, trying to figure all this out when we've got, you know, performance support or resources or job aids or guidance, you know, what, you know, all these things have all these, the same kind of a thing has many different names and it just makes it harder for them climbing the learning curve to, to begin to master all of this themselves. So I, I, that's, a, that's a typical issue. Um, I think where it is useful, I have to say, is that training and instruction are what trainers and instructors do. Learning is what the learner does. And it, it does kind of shift you towards a more learner-centered mindset, if you use that term. Well, that's the hope. Yeah, I, I would hope that people would see it that way. But too often they're thinking, you know, learning, that's referring to, you know, a learning and development product, you know, and a form mm. being packaged. And uh, they don't have that, you know, it's the ends. And we have very various means to create that ends of learning, but but you know that is part of the problem with our language, and I I don't think it's going to go away because you know forty years into it for me, it's still there, and the people that were complaining about it in the early eighties have been complaining about it since the sixties. So I don't know, maybe we're just stuck with it. It just it's what makes our job so interesting and challenging. Um, if we can shift gears here again now, so we we talked a little bit. Uh, uh, previously about some of your early influences and you know so I would like to share have you share with our audience some of the people who you've learned from or been exposed to more recently that you would point other people to um, and perhaps that you can tell us a little bit about that the person or the article or the book that was influential and why you think maybe other people might find it of interest. Um. This is a very recent thing, actually. It, 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 it's kind of the way I work. I find it hard not to, you know, I'm like a dog. I live in the now. <laughs> and I'm, I'm always really caught up with the idea that I've, I've just got enthusiastic about. And I'm really interested in the concept of flow. Um, this came out of the, the, again, I don't want to kind of repeat too much of what's in the Informal Learning, Great Minds on Learning podcast we've just done. But we do cover this. And it's in uh, an episode about, um, informal learning and we, we talk about the book by um, and I'm gonna have a go at pronouncing his name which I did very badly on the podcast Mihai Csikszentmihalyi um, who, who wrote the book about the flow state and a, a, an internationally very famous book and I thought it was so interesting I, I wasn't quite sure why Donald had selected him for this episode because the rest of it was um, you know, people like uh, Victoria Marsic and Gloria Geary and um, it, where kind of learning in the flow of work comes from and informal learning and so on. Uh, and flow is kind of tacked on the end of it. But, but the conclusion we came to was that these people and the growth of the technology that underpins learning in the flow of work now had shifted the focus away from the tyranny of time, as Donald describes it, towards um, the, uh, sorry, away from the tyranny of place, as Donald refers to it, you can edit that out, um, which means that learning always takes place in a classroom or a training center to an emphasis on time, because, you, you know, you now have everything at your fingertips. So, it, you know, you have a phone in your pocket that has uh, all the knowledge in the world um, in there. Um, and so it's more about how you use your time and how, if you're supporting learning in the flow of work, you can make sure that there's a, a, a good flow of time for the learner. I'm not explaining this especially well. 
but it's I'd, I'd say that that confusion is about I find these ideas very interesting and I want to read that book and to pursue more about this because I'm still kind of that the, my knowledge about this and interest in it is still in bits and one of the things that really chimed with me about it is that you know the flow state itself which is what I go into when I write or um uh, working on editing or, or or music or anything significant does monkey with your sense of time you know you you, you kind of sit down to write something um, and an hour goes by like that and suddenly you realize you just haven't been there physically present for that time you've been off in this place um, and there are difficulties with trying to get into the flow to do with procrastination when when you're a writer so I'm, I'm fantastically interested in that kind of the psychology of that flow state and also how it relates to how we design learning now because that flow state of your learners is sacred it's really important to learning it's also important to working um, everything that gets in the way of that and interrupts it has to be kind of cleared out of the way and if we're not careful with a lot of our learning systems we just give people loads and loads of form filling loads and loads of clicks loads and loads of cognitive load and we're destroying that flow state so um, I hope that makes some sense no, it did. I, I, it's been a number of years, I think, since I've read the book, but I enjoyed the podcast and you and Donald talking about this because it really resonated with me. When I get called to breakfast, lunch, or dinner, <laughs> it is often in the middle of I'm doing something and I really hate to make that break. But, but I think that that goes to this notion of, you know, learning in the workflow. We're trying to be as least disruptive of the workflow itself when yeah. we're supporting people and getting the job done, doing the tasks that they need to do, doing the thinking that they need to do about their job tasks. And so I, I think it's an important concept. Uh, I, I've always had this process orientation since I, before I started in the business, I've always been kind of a process oriented person. And it's been called process. It's been called work streams by in the quality movement. Um, and now we're into workflow. So those, again, a part of the language issues that we've got uh, competing terms for the same notion. But I mm. think that that's what one of the things that, that our audience, people in the learning and development field should appreciate is that people are working in some sort of a workflow. And it can be rigorous. It could be very flexible. It could be situationally varied. Uh, or it could be quite rote. And we need to understand the nature of that and decide when is it and how is it that we can prepare people or enable people to do it in the workflow? Or it, would that be too inconvenient? And really, they did need to memorize something before they were faced in that workflow so that they have it on demand. It, mm. It's a repository, their repertoire of knowledge and skills so they can use it because there's sometimes and it's and it's rare but there are times when you don't have time to reference anything you must have it memorized but that's not the the norm that's a rarity and too often we just you know we create things and don't really appreciate and understand that because of how we've gone about gathering our data and our understanding and then designing and developing something you know to help people perform on the job but uh, I think, hmm. go ahead. I, I could relate it back to my early interest in English literature, which I said earlier I studied at university. That, that there's Pert Coleridge, one of the, the romantics, along with Wordsworth and um, Byron and Shelley and so on. He wrote this um, wonderful poem, uh, Kubla Khan, uh, in, um, um, a, a, about the uh, stately pleasure dome that Kubla Khan decreed. And it's unfinished because he got to was the end of it and um, somebody knocked at the door and interrupted him I, I think it was in an opium trance or something it, is the story but there's also the story about the interruption when he was, he was writing it down afterwards uh, and nobody quite knows who it was who interrupted him but he's described I think in the diary as the person from poor fleet person from poor lock I think uh, and uh, a literary agent I was talking to was telling me about this story because I was complaining about how I could never finish me not my second novel, which I still haven't. Um, so I think the too often people who design learning systems become the person from Paul Locke because they're interrupting 
people learners at the wrong time. They're giving them kind of irrelevant stuff to to think about and be treating the, the, the whole thing as an admin task. So, you know, the message is don't be the person from Orlock or Fleet or wherever it was. That's great. I love that. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, no, that, I think that is true. We are, you know, we 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 don't have that appreciation, and we certainly need to if we're going to try to, you know, help people in the workflow and not be disruptive of it because people can lose lose track of where they were, like when we get interrupted in doing our work and you haven't finished your novel, and so we'll be waiting on that. We hope you can carve out some time and, and to work on that. Don't hold your breath. <laughs> John, thanks so much for participating in this uh, video interview with me. So my, my final question is, do you have any parting words of wisdom or guidance for our audience, particularly new people, people new to the L&D field, um, to, to help them related to their, their ability to help people uh, in their target audiences perform better? I think wisdom might be putting it a bit strong, but I, I would say use the theory. Um, doing the Great Minds on Learning has really opened my eyes to what a wealth there is um, a, in the literature about learning, and it is really useful. But also, you have to be careful with it because some of it, frankly, is rubbish. Um, there's a lot of snake oil about, um, and there is a difficulty in that some of it seems contradictory. Even the kind of good stuff, you know, with with proper empirical evidence behind it, might seem to pull in different directions. And I think people can pitch into this and then suddenly find, oh, well, this is contradicting it, isn't it? Um, because, you know, the, the effective domain, learning domain tells you, you've got to engage people and they, you've got to make them feel emotions because if they don't care about it, they won't learn anything, you know, the Nick Shackleton Jones stuff. On the other hand, there's the kind of sweller and cognitive load stuff that says, you know, if you're overstimulating people, they're not learning, you know, and video might be, very exciting and, and make you feel emotions, but um, it might, might linger, you know, not linger at all in the right way and in, in the memory. So it, it, it seems that you hear one thing, you hear another thing, they contradict each other. So maybe what we need there is kind of an engineering mindset. People do talk about being lear learning engineers and that kind of makes sense for me. My father was an aeronautical engineer um, and I grew up with these books full of colourful diagrams of the shapes of wings and the forces that go over them. Um, and in order to, to design an airplane, you have to balance forces of lift, weight, thrust and drag. You know, lift because the shape of the wing takes you up as the thrust pulls, pulls you forward. But there's also gravity pulling you down. And there's also drag, which is the kind of dragger that's in the air that is, is, is stopping the wing cutting through it. So it's a balance, balancing of all those four forces. And I, th I think in a way, you probably have to think about learning design in a similar way. You know, you want the effective engagement, but you don't want the overstimulation. You need to know enough, enough about all those forces and how they work to get the thing off the ground. I hope that isn't too trite. <laughs> Well, thank you for that. That just reminded me of the lesson, one of the lessons, many lessons of the late Bob Mager, Robert F. Mager, uh, who always talked about the need to test things before you unleash them on your audience and the importance of that. So that made me think of pilot testing as pilots being testing the new uh, aircraft to make sure that it had the lift, enough lift, and it was con a controllable uh, aircraft. Uh, but J John, thank you so much for doing this interview with me. And again, I'm going to put uh, your contact information and uh, links to your two podcasts in the show notes and anything else that I can dig up uh, and point people to you. And I may even include uh, my uh, YouTube playlist for the piranhas as uh, oh, wow. yeah. but, but something else that can be added and uh, for people's uh, enjoyment when they, when they need to extract themselves from their workflow. But well, there is, thank you there so is a much. box set. Out, yeah. There is a box set, as you say, now of everything the prize ever recorded came out um, this year. So rush up and buy it. <laughs> but I, I do have to say, though, uh, thank you so much, Guy, for all your support with the podcasts and your, your, your sharing and liking on social media and so on that gets us across to new friends and keeps the stuff up there in people's consciousness. It, it, we, we really do appreciate your support and help.
So you're most welcome. And I'm, I'm here to support people with that performance orientation and to have an impact with uh, evidence-based or evidence-informed uh, approaches. Thanks, John. Thanks.